स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning, a joint venture by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. As you are aware, we are in a series of lectures entitled, collectively entitled Cultural Studies. Let me welcome you to this lecture on memetics and see how memetics could be a part of cultural studies. Now, as always, let us do a recap of the last lecture. In the last lecture, which was devoted to the origins of the modern mind, we uh, took the help of a work by uh, Merlin Donald in a bit to understand, you know, the narrative, the way, the origin of the, you know, the or origins of the modern mind, the mind that created culture. Okay. Um, the way the narrative of the growth and development of such a mind uh, is sketched out. I also added a caveat in that lecture, wherein I said that this may not be the one we are for, you know, we are following that is the narrative sketched out by Merlin Donald need not be the only uh, or the sort uh, or even the, you know, uh, the only authentic picture of how it began. After all, you know, as you saw in our lecture in evolutionary psychology, you know, um, these are always processes of reverse engineering. Okay? We go back by looking at our, uh, you know, current, um, you know, current propensities and current capabilities. Right? So, um, the essay that we looked at was origins of the modern mind and uh, the three stages. And we found that there were three major transformations in that the first transition involved mimetic skill and auto cueing. And we understood auto cueing as recollection in memory that did not need any external clues. right? And mimetic skill as, a, as representation using the whole body. Second, we found that in the next transition, um, and there was a lexical invention which eventually led to the formation of myths okay, and storytelling that is narrative thought. And finally, we saw that the third transition involved the externalization of memory, where memory is not only in our brains uh, or uh, where, mem where memory is uh, external and stored in things like books, in um, hard disks, okay, in uh, CDs, etc., and how that gave us indeed a new memory representation and a new working memory architecture. The important point is, however, that we are not studying these things from a physiological or anatomical point of view, okay? not even from a purely evolutionary biology point of view. Why we are bringing in is because we, as we, as I said earlier, we are looking at what science has to tell us. Okay, about ourselves, about the kind of beings that we are, the kind of complex organisms that we are. Okay? And all these three transitional phases that is mimetic skill and auto cueing, uh, then the descent of the larynx leading to more and more you know, vowel sounds and the growth of the lexicon, the, the expansion of the brain, okay? then uh, the externalization of memory. All these were as Donald said played out at the cultural level and that is why we need to look at or needed to look at these in the first place. Then the first transition um, is something we have already been through, so I will not look at this slide. So, this is the second transition which gave us a capacity for lexical invention and a high speed phonological apparatus and these were the two new features and the third transition we call the external memory storage and retrieval system and a new working memory architecture. right? So, we are now going to look at memetics and let me at the beginning say that memetics um, 
why I you know I can tell you why I have brought in uh, the study of mimetics here and this is uh, you know really an end of one phase of looking at cultural studies in our lectures from a scientific perspective where we had said early on that we cannot you know we cannot leave out what science has to say. Remember what Barker said that the empirical rigors of science are something that also that spirit has to be um, has to be you know um, incorporated into cultural studies and the bicultural perspective is something that we cannot uh, we cannot do without okay without the bicultural perspective we would not have the proper foundation so to speak we would only be talking about floating signifiers and signifying practices one of the you know um, one of the criti criticisms okay uh, levied against cultural studies right the essay that would be our main you know, uh, you know, uh, reference point is a chapter in a very famous book, a very popular book by Richard Dawkins, namely The Selfish Gene, uh, where he has towards the end a chapter on mimetics. And the it is an, uh, you know, it uh, mimetics is um, an attempt, right? It is an attempt to explain culture. Uh, using the analogy from genetics. Okay. So, if you look at the term genetics and mimetics, first they, they do rhyme. Okay. More importantly, if the gene is the uh, you know uh, you know the, the unit right or the basic unit in genetics. So, the analogy that Dawkins draws is between our mimetics as a whole draws is between the gene and the mim as basic units respectively of the physical and the mental all or the cultural. Well, so let us see what this field however, uh, uh, curious a science it is dubbed to be, but there are of course, also many adherence to mimetics. And so, we need to see what mimetics tells us about ourselves as cultural beings. The key source texts in this lecture are Chris Barker's Cultural Studies Theory and Practice, Richard Dawkins The Selfish Gene and Susan Blackmore's The, the Meme Machine. Okay. So, let us, let us now define mimetics okay. and we shall define the field of mimetics after the definition given by scholars like Richard Dawkins and this is the definition of mimetics as a discourse. The theoretical and empirical science that studies the replication, spread and evolution of MIMS. So, we saw you know just a while ago that MIMS are the basic units of cultural transmission. Okay. MIMS are uh, information units that we have and we shall see in a way this entire lecture will be devoted to the way MIMS work and what they are MIM complexes etcetera. Okay. And the analogy you see here is with the gene. So, the gene uh, gene evolution and MIM evolution are that is an analogy being drawn by Dawkins. Okay. We of course, have to understand that like many areas in, in, in knowledge formation like many you know procedures in, norm, uh, in knowledge formation there is also this is you know the the relation is analogous in nature, but it does throw very interesting lights. Okay, if we have to talk about also as us having one uh, you know basic unit that is the mim. Now, what is the significance of studying mimetics? Now, the uh, significance of studying mimetics. Now, what is mimetics? Again, the theoretical and empirical science that studies the replication, spread, and evolution of basic cultural units known as mims. So, they construct evolutionary models of information transfer, this is important. Okay. Information transfer from brain to brain, also knowledge transfer eventually from brain to brain are seen or can be modeled along evolutionary processes like we have done the modeling of the evolutionary processes of the gene. Second, it also is very important as a theory of the mind, okay. that is also how you know uh, how the mind works in the sense that how our information uh, you know uh, how our information um, bits of information imitated okay later on we find that mimetics comes from the greek word mimesis okay which means imitation so how do we imitate one another okay as far as you know knowledge is concerned knowledge is basically by or by and large okay a matter of imitation so as a theory of mind and how the mind works 
it is uh, it is supposed to be valuable for us and finally memes as external observable cultural artifacts and behaviors okay memes are actual things and we shall see in a while very interestingly how they are even though they are objects in the mind how they can also be actual so memes are also observable okay external to us even they are there in our brains they are observable they are cultural artifacts and behaviors that we may uh, you know uh, we may observe we may comment upon and we, we may explore from a scientific and cultural point of view okay so the significance of again the the, the discourse of memetics is this that memetics gives us models of information transfer right uh, cultural transfer second memetics is important and useful as a theory of mind and memes are um, you know they are externally observable by us as units of behavior okay and units of cultural artifacts fine so now you have an idea of what memetics is and the you know the why it could be useful for us for from a cultural studies perspective many books on cultural studies do you know uh, do have a chapter or do at least have you know a section on memetics because it is one of the theories of cultural transfer right now we am reading from dawkins's uh, chapter on memetics which i said was uh, the uh, text from which many of the points and quotations would be given and uh, as always dawkins is also one of my favorite um, writers he has authored so many books for instance uh, the god delusion um, then uh, you know of course the selfish gene and climbing mount uh, improbable etc okay uh, unweaving the rainbow so some of the books he even though he's a biologist well perhaps because he's a biologist okay there is uh, you know he has an uh, his beautiful felicity okay in his writing uh, if not also quite you know an unforgiving attitude uh, to those who practice religion right so dawkins is really one of my favorite writers now let's see what he has to say he says most of what is unusual about man can be summed up in one word culture so here you see a definition of human beings of definition of uh, man as a species being given from the point of view of culture right we have definitions of man given from the point of view of religion from the point of view of science for instance okay here he says what whatever is unusual about us at least compared uh, to other species is culture now this is not to say that other species do not have culture okay but the the level of sophistication that we have the level of variety that we have uh, the complexity that we have in our cultural formations in our cultural behaviors in our practices and in the artifacts that we create definitely uh, these are um, incomparable and uh, that is what makes according to dawkins makes us uh, unusual as a species then let's read on again i use the word not in its snobbish sense but as a scientist uses it okay so he says this is important and that is why we need to look at this he says i am you know looking at the word culture not in a snobbish sense further cultural transmission is analogous to genetic transmission in that although basically conservative it can give rise to a form of evolution i would say this part of the essay or th these lines are the most important okay it needs to be quoted here cultural transmission is analogous to genetic transmission in that although basically conservative it can give rise to a form of evolution what do we mean by conservative here conservative here doesn't you know though it is analogous doesn't mean the way we understand conservative as somebody having conservative views or orthodox views conservative here means um, you know or more resistant right to change right so you cannot have changes very quickly he says cultural transmission is also it's not that culture culture changes uh, very uh, quickly or very frequently there are things that are conservative in culture but at the same time it does give rise to change and it is this what is this form of evolution of cultural change how does it change how does it evolve really using words from biology this is what uh, is 
the aim of Richard Dawkins and the aim of other practitioners of memetics like Susan Blackmore as I have mentioned a while ago. Okay? And it is in this spirit that um, you know we have to look at memetics as a part of cultural studies. Therefore, uh, if you look at this diagram here, cultural transmission and genetic transmission both are processes of evolution. Then what uh, you know uh, what comprises memetics okay what are memes and this is what Dawkins has to say fashions and dress and diet ceremonies and customs art and architecture engineering and technology okay all evolve in historical time that looks like highly speeded up genetic evolution but has nothing to do with genetic evolution okay so anything cultural anything you would say man made be it you know the high technology that you are learning be it art be it even things like fashion or even fads in music and dress be these customs rituals and ceremonies that we practice okay architectural designs and forms all these things are to be studied under memetics why because they are cultural forms okay and importantly that they have a trajectory of development or trajectory of evolution that has this has nothing to do with genetic evolution. So, now we all this while we have been talking about genetic evolution, okay, biological evolution. So, now we have another aspect being shown to us by Dawkins and that is uh, you know uh, that is a, a memetic evolution okay, or evolution of culture or cultural units. So, this should be very interesting uh, uh, to us and let us see how you know this is also culture is also implicated in a series of evolutionary processes and stages. Right? So, look at this slide please as we saw again fashions, ceremonies, art, customs, architectures, uh, technology all these things fall under the study of memetics and all these things as you know are part and parcel of our culture they are they lead to cultural practices. Okay? Uh, the fashion that you follow is a cultural practice okay? it is not only that customs are our cultural practice uh, the kind um, you know your get up the way um, uh, you know the the way you uh, you know turn yourself out okay these are also matters of culture so on a more serious note now what uh, what i would like to bring to your to your notice is there's something very important that we find in his chapter on memetics okay and this is something that uh, not many people have really articulated right it is said that compared to chemistry and uh, and physics Right, if you look at the sciences, the hard sciences that is compared to chemistry and physics, it is said that in biology it is more difficult to have laws. Okay? Listen to this carefully, there are many who have, who have uh, you know agreed uh, with, with this formulation made uh, by scientists that whereas in chemistry and physics you do have laws. right? laws that, we have very, that are very strong for instance the laws of motion of Newton, the laws of gravitation right. Um, uh, in, in, uh, in biology we do not really have a fundamental law. So, he says that well I want to hear you know attempt to formulate a fundamental law of all life right. And the fundamental law he says is that all life evolves by the differential survival of replicating entities. Listen to this very carefully. All life whether you know it is mimetic life, cultural life, whether it is genetic life and some would, and he even says in his and he also says in his essay you know reverberating electronic circuits right. All kinds of life if we at all you know accept that reverberating electronic circuits are also life of some kind. Okay. All life evolves by the differential survival of replicating entities, these are all replicating entities, entities that are repeated that replicate themselves right. In the end the this word is something you will find also in our lectures on evolution. The whole idea of differential survival, it is not survival per se, but difference in survival rates right uh, in members of a population that is the bedrock of Darwinian evolutionary theory right. Um, 
why does one uh, you know uh, why does one organism fail why the other while the other survives right so if you look uh, I at least get increasingly drawn you know uh, from my very limited interest in biology I get increasingly drawn by this statement by Dawkins that all life evolves by the differential survival of replicating entities and I find it immensely imp interesting that he is applying this to the cultural realm as well. Now, he then asks this fundamental question, are genes the only replicators? Okay, we have already said, always said that genes are replicators, they get transmitted uh, you know from generation to generation. And uh, he says that well uh, all this while the sciences have told us that genes are you know the fundamental replicators of the world. Can we not say that there is something else that is also evolving and something else that is also evol evolving by differential uh, survival that is also replicating itself right. And then he has an answer to this question. He says that the MIMS or what are MIMS again let us recall the definition of MIMS. MIMS are the basic units of cultural transmission. Okay? As genes are the basic units of genetic transmission, MIMS are the basic units of uh, cultural transmission. Remember this entire uh, this entire discourse you know of memetics has to be understood and read sort of uh, in tandem with the discourse of genetics. Okay? And then you find the striking similarities and at some points of course, you see that the similarity stops and memetics goes on to have a life of its own and a rationale and discourse of its own. So, then uh, let us again read from Dawkins' text, MIM is an information pattern as we have seen held in an individual's brain which is capable of being copied to another or several individuals memory. Okay? So, MIM therefore, you know we have talked about the MIM as a cultural unit, here we have another perspective on the MIM. Okay? The MIM is an information pattern which is held in an individual's brain. Uh, even then uh, you know a patch of a song is an information pattern that is held in your brain. A, a short melody can also be an information pattern which is there in your brain. And interestingly, you know, Dawkins follows um, a scientist named Humphrey, uh, N. K. Humphrey, by uh, citing him and saying that, well, memes are not just, you know, uh, memes are not just a pattern that is virtual, memes are also physical things. Now, you may wonder how a meme is supposed to be physical, how a meme that is to do with culture uh, that uh, you know it has to do with thoughts and patterns can be can be um, uh, can be a physical one. Okay? The point is every thought whether cultural or not every to do with culture or not or cultural practices and forms every thought actually is physical. Okay, many of you have now prob probably getting what I am saying or what um, Dawkins is saying through Humphrey is that if thinking has to do with neural the firing of neurons inside your brain, okay, then patterns are created right. A thought is then involved with ne neural firing, okay, the firing of neurons and in that sense it becomes a physical entity it becomes sort of real entity other than you know as we understand thoughts as being different from our brains. Thoughts are not different from our brains, Thought are, thoughts are part and process part uh, and parcel of the entire process of the brain. So, MIM is an, let us look at this slide, MIM is an information pattern held in an individual's brain which is capable of being copied to another or several individuals memory. The etymology of the word relates uh, to the Greek word mimim, this is important for something imitated. As I mentioned a while ago, the word mimetics uh, comes from mim, mim is um, a borrowing from the Greek root word or sorry, the Greek word mimim for means something imitated. So, now we know that you know the process of transmission of these mimetic units okay, has to be imitation. Right? So, we imitate if you 
low, you know, if you if you um, consider it very deeply, you know, if you reflect on it, you'll understand that all we most of the things that we do are imitations. So imitation is uh, this is not to deny that there are no improvements in knowledge and there are no radically new findings, but essentially as learners, what we do is we imitate. So again, the slide. As Dawkins says, here it refers to evolutionary principles in explaining the spread of ideas and cultural phenomena. So, we saw the, all these lectures before this, we, we saw we evolution came in in a big way in a couple of lectures, and uh, we are really ending this this part of you know uh, this module by uh, finally trying to you know sort of crack the cultural code if I may use the word okay, to finally see how we may explain cultural evolution. Therefore, mim is my mim or something imitated and then Dawkins says that you know uh, let us now we have made an analogy we have rhyme genetics and memet, you know memetics we have talked about gene and mim okay, we have made an analogy, but we need to stop here right and see how memetics can be carved out as um, you know uh, uh, as a discourse in its own right that does not borrow you know or lean so heavily on genetics. Okay. So, let us read for uh, from him for an understanding of the evolution of modern man. We must begin by throwing out the gene as the sole basis of our ideas on evolution. Mim can be termed as a noun that conveys the unit of cultural transmission or a unit of imitation. A mim could consist of a single word or a mim could consist of the entire speech in which that word first, first occurred. So, mim, mim and its pattern may hold one word simple word as I said a part of a symphony or an entire symphony. Therefore, we see that the mim is a noun and as a noun it is a unit of cultural transmission or of imitation. Then Dawkins goes on to, to again draw you know he says that like we have gene uh, pools, we also have mim pools right. Uh, in the gene pools we have genes that are used for reproduction in the mim pools there are mims okay, that are transferred to a pro, through a process or the reproduced rather through imitation. So, examples of mims again uh, may be and he explicates this uh, further by saying that these are tunes. Uh, okay, from music, these are ideas, these are catch phrases, clothes, their fashion, technology, even language and even religion okay, because all, all these have to do with culture or way of life. Okay. Show me any one of this that is not part of culture or way of living or part of our cultural forms and practices. Right. Then Dawkins moves into an area which um, many may consider controversial. He believes that you know uh, the idea of God is really a psychological crutch that human beings need in you know in the face of um, in the in the face of despair, in the face of the unknown, in the face of grief. Okay, that we it's a crutch that is very important, it is not that it is not important okay. and he in a way uh, by saying that it is a psychological crutch, uh, however indirectly okay, is saying that this is something that is used by people. But he also talks about the fact that after all as uh, you know as a part of our thinking okay, as a thought unit, God should be and has to be considered also a meme okay, or a cultural object that is there in our brains. And then in typical uh, Dawkins style, this is how he argues okay, against the existence of God and he says this, the everlasting arms obviously referring to God and God is shown as somebody who will embrace us after our death okay, into his everlasting arms. The everlasting arms hold out a cushion against our own inadequacies which like look at this a doctor's placebo is nonetheless effective for being imaginary. Look at this very carefully. He says that the idea, the idea that there is a God who will always protect us, the idea that you know, uh, you know, it's like a safety cushion, right? It's a cushion that you know um, that protects us from our own inadequacies. If you look 
at ourselves without the idea of God it, in a godless universe. It is very, very few people have the courage really if I may use the word after Dawkins to live in a world or live in a perceiving um, situation in which and live with the perception that this is a godless universe, okay, that things have evolved and we have a totally scientific also science based scientific finding based you know approach uh, to God. So, it says that this is like a doctor's placebo. Now, what is a placebo? You know that a placebo is a sort of you know a tablet that is given by the doctor or a nurse to a patient and that tablet is not exactly a drug, it may be you know it uh, it is something that is maybe a vitamin or uh, something which is uh, uh, you know uh, 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 a, a sweet uh, a sweet object okay and the patient is given the placebo uh, and is told that this is a drug that this is a medicine that is going to cure you for various reasons medical reasons placebos are given but the patient takes it with the belief Okay, now, this is very important takes it with the belief that he or she will be cured by this drug or by this uh, you know item of medication. Right? So, he says he draws this analogy and he says that you know the idea of God like a safety cushion is like a doctor's placebo which is nonetheless effective for being imaginary. It is imaginary, but at the same time uh, it is effective and has uh, probably if we were all to um, you know uh, not believe in a universe or created by God, then probably many of us would psychologically not be able to cope with that sort of a reality. Then he says God exists if only in the form of a meme with high survival value. Okay? The idea of God has been there since many so many um, you know hundreds of years and the idea of God probably is there to stay also for some time. God exists if only in the form of a meme with high survival value evolutionary speaking or infective power look at the word he uses infective power in the environment provided by human culture. So, the idea of no God and the idea of God if you say that evolutionary in an evolutionary schema uh, the idea of God by differential replicate uh, sorry differential survival the idea of God has survived while the idea of no God is yet to is no has not survived or has is yet to sort of uh, as Dawkins would believe is yet to uh, you know make itself um, uh, make itself win over the idea of a God right. So, it has high survival value one of the uh, one of the requirements of a meme to survive and we shall see there are other um, you know the other qualities that memes should have to survive. So, what are the features that memes should have in order to survive these are longevity fecundity and copying fidelity a meme has to be around for, for a certain amount of time to be transmitted okay, to be accepted by people and to be transmitted from as it says from brain to brain. Okay. Then it, there has to be a certain fertility fecundity about the meme and there has to be a certain copying fidelity. You can not say that the meme has been transmitted and give a radically different view okay, of the meme. He gives an example of Darwin's theory of evolution, right? Say, in passing from person A to person B, Darwin's theory of evolution may undergo changes, right? But the essential components and the essential, so to speak, uh, description or delineation of Darwin's theory as he gave it, that is something that has has a fidelity about it. Okay, and we are expected as teachers and a teacher or refer to it, we are expected to be as close to the original as possible. Right? So, these are again an important point in his essay that these are the three features that are required for a meme for, uh, for it to have a survival value. Then they, there is another interesting um, portion where he talks about you know mutually assisting memes. Right? Um, he says that it's memes are never in isolation, right? Memes are not discrete units. Memes, a we know that memes are there in the meme pool, like genes are there in the gene pool. He also says that some memes, sort of, if you look at visually, some memes come together and coalesce, right, to form certain complexes, right, where they assist one another. 
one mim will help another now you can take the idea as he also gives us the idea of god and the idea ideas in religion right he says now let's read from him some mims become associated with one another and this association assists the survival of each of the participating mims leading to a very strong what we call mim we call mim complex okay to take a particular example dawkins says an aspect of doctrine that has been very effective in enforcing religious observance is the threat of hellfire right so uh, the idea of god the idea is tied to the idea of eternal punishment or of eternal damnation or eternal reward you cannot separate the two you cannot simply say that there you know in, in at least in established religion right you cannot say that uh, only the idea of god is there or that god exists okay there are many supporting cultural institutions cultural forms and mims there are many way many kind of thoughts or units of thought that add or fortify so to speak uh, you know these mega mims like the god mim right so the threat of hellfire after death uh, you know uh, depending on what kind of life we have led if we have led a so called um, bad life then we are supposed to burn in hell as the famous phrase goes right then he says however so he therefore is not simply describing these things and and telling us in a very academic sort of way or in a you know in a non involved uh, sort of way what memes are he has uh, his own way of putting things as it were and this is what he says the threat of hellfire is a peculiarly nasty technique of persuasion causing great psychological anguish throughout the middle ages and even today but it is highly effective okay so you see this the god meme has survived the god meme may have caused a lot of anguish in people and certainly in children if he says that's what dawkins says if he indoctrinate children in the idea of if you do this if you do this bad thing you will rot in hell or burn in hell he says this is extremely damaging uh, damaging for children and it has in earlier times caused a great deal of psychological anguish in uh, humanity uh, particularly in the christian world right then he gives gives us an uh, example of how you know all this while we've been talking about mims and genes but he says i said earlier that he is going to come away from genes and is going to show us some differences well he says that um, mims and genes may not always reinforce one another okay now let's read he says conflicts among mims and genes and i'll quickly go through his uh, words mims and genes may reinforce each other but they sometimes come into opposition uh, mim complexes evolved in the same kind of way as co adapted gene complexes that is what we have uh, seen selection favors mims that exploit the cultural environment to their own advantage and this is you know the god mim for instance is an example or other mims is examples of you know a mim being able to exploit its cultural environment which is essentially we we identify dawkins identifies as an environment of fear of the unknown okay fear of uh, death fear of loss grief etc okay and this is how mims as he says you know uh, fortify themselves but he says that it's not necessary that memetics and genetics have to go together now he gives us an interesting example of celibacy right and he says uh, that celibacy how can cel if celibacy is a mim or a thought in our minds an idea in our minds uh, then and if genetics is about or if evolution and uh, survival is also tied into reproduction and we are supposed to transmit our, our genes right to the next generation then how do you explain celibacy celibacy then becomes an anomaly right it some it becomes like suicide okay like suicide celibacy also becomes an analogy right in suicide you are um, you are negating one of the pillars of darwinian 
evolution which is survival. In celibacy you are negating another pillar of Darwinian evolution that is reproduction. Okay? So, let us see what how he puts it. For example, the habit of celibacy is presumably not inherited genetically. A gene for celibacy puts it beautifully a gene for celibacy is doomed to failure in the gene pool a mem whereas, a mem for celibacy can be successful in the mem pool. Now, celibacy particularly uh, you know if we see it as another supporting mem for the god mem okay, as, as far as priests in some uh, you know uh, denominations are expected to be celibate. In that case what happens is uh, we know that mem is successful because it is part uh, you know it has survived and it has also helped you know the greater god mem complex. Okay. It has been an addition to and it has fortified the greater fortified the greater god mem, co mem complex, but it is a failure as far as genetics is concerned. That is why Dawkins says that we have to at some point of time we cannot move on the mem cannot be simply following the gene or the trajectory of the gene. Uh, culture is therefore, different you know from certain natural propensities if I use a word like natural selection like survival and reproduction. So, that we may have completely uh, you know com, you know things completely at odd memes completely at odds like suicide and celibacy that are at odds with the discourse of genetics. That is why you know memetics is an area I believe which needs to be explored in cultural studies. Then uh, comes another point which he says that you know he says we are gene machines right in one way of describing ourselves of course, we are gene machines and we are created to pass on our genes to the next generation and those you know sort of scientists who are uh, completely with the gene or who see is say everything in terms of the gene okay, uh, would also some have even called uh, the human body. Uh, simply a vehicle for the transmission of genes that is one way of looking and describing the human being that we are just vehicles uh, because these things called genes want to replicate and you know get passed on. Anyhow, we are gene machines and we are created to pass on our genes to the to the next generation, but he says you know it is wrong or it is futile really for us to uh, think that our immortality lives that is in our genes. Okay. Many people you, know, you have seen this is also the staple of movies, the staple of literature uh, believe that you know it is only when you have children that you know you pass on only when you have children that you know uh, you are immortalized in your children that through your genes you are immortalized okay, because your children are carrying your genes. But he, he says well if you have to look to want immortality then you surely have to look elsewhere and not at the gene. He because as he says in this slide as each generation passes the distrib the contribution of our genes are halved that is the scientific truth. Right. So, by the time he says that uh, you know uh, what happens then to the gene of these um, genes of these uh, people like uh, Leonardo da Vinci for instance or Galileo for instance okay, what has what is the fate of their genes if their genes are halved if the contribution of our genes are halved as both parents contribute to the progeny. Okay. So, beautifully put. So, he says so immortality should not be sought through reproduction to physical reproduction. If at all we want immortality we have immortality through memetic reproduction. We remember Socrates, we remember Einstein, we remember Newton, Marie Curie, we remember you know um, all these great personalities Mozart, Beethoven, uh, we remember them uh, not through people who are you know so many at a, so many generations removed from them from them. We do not even know how many of us know uh, who you know whether Galileo had children ok Newton did not have children how many of us know or you know where the genes of Socrates are right. So, he says if you have to want or, or if you have to aim at immortality then aim at immortality through your mims and not through your genes aim at immortality through your cultural contribution. Now, by cultural contribution we mean contribution in various levels of human activity and human thinking and human knowledge. Okay. Hence, he says so immortality should not be sought through uh, reproduction. Then uh, we shall end with uh, you know the points that uh, in fact uh, are 
extremely important as far as mimetics is concerned and it does away with some of our fears. For instance, he says that well all, in that, all these things that we are talking about, all these things that mimetics talks about does it mean that you know we are mim machines and that does it mean that we are gene machines and that we are completely slaves of these, that our brains are simply carriers vehicles for thoughts and mims, that our bodies are vehicles for carrying genes. Are we is that all that we are or is there a way out and he says definitely there is a way out and he points to two characteristics that we have our redeeming characteristics so to speak and let us look at this slide. These are that human beings have conscious foresight and that human beings have altruism. Okay. So, uh, you know so well put by Dawkins uh, we should think right that we have conscious foresight we are not all the time looking for short term gains, we are looking for long term gains for which we can sacrifice some of our mims, for which we can uh, sort of uh, we can remove some of our mims from our system or you know, how do I put it, so that we can uh, you know ignore some of our mimetic propensities. Okay. Why? Because we have a quality known as conscious foresight, the, con the quality of conscious foresight does not uh, you know drop from the heavens really, it is it is part and parcel of our evolutionary lineage right. We have learned through trial and error methods to retain this characteristic of conscious foresight of trying to sacrifice the small gains for a much bigger gain. And the other point is altruism right, the, our, our uh, propensity to help people right, our propensity to sacrifice particularly for kin right. These are things that save us from being slavish imitators of memes, of thoughts, of cultural products right. So, these are the two things which as he said help us from being victims as it were to memes and let us see how he says it. He ends by saying we are built as gene machines and cultured as meme machines, but we have the power to turn against our own creators that is the gene and the meme. We alone on earth can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicators and in that sense he is using the term selfish. Now, selfish here again many you know many may have thought about why what is the um, what is it what does he mean by uh, uh, giving a title like the selfish gene. Now, we should not think of it in terms of the way we understand human beings as being selfish for some end you know something for, for our own good or you know uh, we would be doing an a sort of anthropocentric fallacy here if we say that genes also think like us. The point here and this is where how um, you know Dawkins has also explained elsewhere, he says that when I say selfish I mean that it is a characteristic built into the gene and by analogy it is a characteristic built into the meme. We at least know as human beings that we can be selfish or we can we are not selfish on some cases we, uh, uh, we decide not to be selfish, which means that we have a meta thinking in which we understand that it is we are capable of selfishness. Genes and memes on the other hand are selfish in the sense that selfishness is built into them into the nature of the gene and the meme. Why? Because they simply have they also call the blind, blind replicators, their job is to replicate, their job is to replicate themselves. So, in that sense it says that well genes and memes are now part of us, they are not you know then in, the, in another sense they are not our creators and then he says we alone on earth can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish uh, replicators fine. So, we will now go into the discussion. And if you get a question like define memetics, we then say after Richard Dawkins that memetics is a theoretical and empirical science that studies what the replication spread and evolution of something known as memes. And then we go on to explain that memes may be defined as units of cultural transmission. Then second question, how according to Dawkins is cultural transmission analogous to genetic transmission. Now, we will use you know refer to this portion of his essay where he says that cultural transmission is analogous to genetic transmission because it can give rise to a form of evolution and evolution really is the connecting term here. Why? Because we are understanding both genetic evolution and memetic uh, uh, you know genetic reproduction and memetic reproduction or imitation through as an evolutionary process. Okay. 
Then what according to Dawkins is the fundamental law of all life, this is really my favorite, all life evolves by the differential survival of replicating entities and it may be you know silicon based life, carbon based life, okay, it may be the life of the MIM, okay, but the law if at all we have to zoom, we can zoom in. This is of course, um, not a textbook law, but it is a formulation been given uh, very ingeni ingeniously by Darwin as after all he is a biologist and he says all life evolves by differential, we have talked about what explain what differential survival is. The differential survival or differential reproduction uh, entails having a difference with competing organisms. Okay? So, all life evolves by the differential survival of replicating entities. Then cite a few examples of MIMS, examples of MIMS as we saw are um, all the things that have to do with our cultural forms and artifacts like tunes from music, ideas, catch phrases, uh, fashion, um, ways of making tools, pots or architectural forms. Uh, even language and religion, these are all products of our culture and these are also memes. Again, these may be just a snatch of a song or part of you know um, uh, an idea or you know short catch phrases or even part of language or religion um, and it can be the whole of a symphony for instance instead of a, a short patch. All these are to be considered as memes. Then what are the survival qualities of memes? The survival qualities of memes are that they have to live long enough to you know so that they can be uh, as in genetic uh, transmission that they can they should be around so to speak in the memosphere if I may use the word in the memosphere they have to be long uh, to be uh, around for long in order to be transmitted at all. Then second there has to be a certain fecundity or fertility about them and a copying fidelity. The meme will not remain, it will become another meme okay, if you change the original meme too much. Then why does the god meme have high survival value and this of course, uh, is typical Dawkins and he says that the, the god, uh, the idea of god is really an idea or a meme right in the uh, it has high survival value because of its great psychological appeal it and remember he says even if it is imaginary imaginary it is effective it is a psychological crutch that is used it has great psychological appeal uh, ideas like the afterlife ideas like the you know uh, you know the, ref, the that we can take refuge in god after our death etc or that at least that the wrongs that we have received in this life will be remedied in the next etcetera and we uh, you know uh, we can go on to higher forms of you know um, or forms of life that we do not usually know about. All these are extremely appealing and helps humankind okay. we have to at least run this that it helps humankind live otherwise there would have been probably complete chaos. Uh, in the human population. Then what are the finally what are the two qualities we possess that may not have evolved memetically the two qualities that we have which save us from being complete slaves to memes okay, uh, and, to, and to genes are our con uh, capacity for conscious foresight and our capacity for genuine altruism. Right? So, these are the two things which ensure that we are not slaves or slavish imitators right? or we are not completely ruled by our genes and memes. Well, um, this is where we stop here and this also ends the you know the the uh, the scientific so to speak right uh, this um, the the work on memetics or this course of memetics really a bridge between what we have done before uh, which are this is a scientific way of looking at culture and to see what bioculture has to tell us about ourselves and after this we will be moving into some other uh, areas and I really hope this was useful for you again as I said a controversial field, but this is something that many people have added in their understanding of culture why because memetics is a theory of culture and that is why we need to incorporate study. Thank you so much.